Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, Roy, to the Roy Gasso for inviting me to uh, say a few words today. Thank you very much. I wish to stay today. Um, I have been developing these ideas for a couple of decades now, and I think that um, I hope very much that you will find them interesting. They certainly relate to all the different things we have heard today from comrades in Nicaragua and Brazil and uh, 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 Bolivia and, and, and Cuba and elsewhere, and I hope you will find them very interesting too. Um, my name is Radhika Desai and I come from Canada and I wanted to say a couple of things about that. I belong to a very small activist group called the Venezuela Peace Committee. And unfortunately, I have to report that our country is not only very far from understanding the struggles of the Venezuelan people, but it has been taking a very active role in opposition to the Bolivarian government. We are trying very hard to do something about it. We have elections coming up this fall in a, in a couple of months. We don't think that what we that given our numbers right now, that we will have much of an effect on the elections. Indeed, it looks as though the liberal government will be replaced by an even more right-wing government. However, I do want to say a couple of things about what the problem in Canada is, because I think it directly relates to the situation in Venezuela. Canada has been taking a lead role in imposing sanctions and generally mobilizing what these um, imperialist powers called the international community against Venezuela. Of course, the size of this international community is dwindling every day. You just had the Non-Aligned Movement meeting here with 120 countries represented. I think that is a great sign, and I think that this number will increase. But Canada belongs to, is part of the imperialist world, and that's the role it is playing. The position of our government is often attributed to the role of Foreign Minister Christian Freeland. I do think Christian Freeland is something of a rather ugly character. She has taken extremely regressive positions on many issues, including for that matter Ukraine and, and many others. And certainly she has been in the lead role trying to organize um, uh, opposition to the Bolivarian process here in Venezuela. But this is not just because of Christian Freeland. She's pretty bad, but it's not just because of her. It's because something more fundamental has happened in Canada which everybody should understand. Since the election of the Harper government, that was in the early 2000s, Canada, the politics in Canada has reflected a very big change. Back in the 1960s, people used to complain that the Canadian economy is dominated by the American economy. Dependency theory, which has, which originated in Latin America, was trotted out to explain that Canada is subordinate to the United States. Of course, those who said it were progressive intellectuals. They wanted the Canadian economy to be run in the interest of Canadians, not Americans, and not, and not even just Canadian capitalists. They wanted it to be run in the interest of Canadians. However, governments in capitalist countries are capitalist governments. They do what capitalists want to do. As a result, successive governments since the 1970s have followed the process of fostering the emergence of a Canadian capitalist class, a specifically Canadian capitalist class. What is the nature of this Canadian capitalist class? To understand that, you have to understand what Canada is. It's a white settler colony. It's a white settler colony that stole the lands of its indigenous people under false pretenses, claiming to make equal treaties with them which they then systematically proceeded to violate. In such a country, the capitalist class has only one or two pushes from nationalism to internationalism from socialism in various countries into a worldwide socialism in which borders and nation states will wither away, as Marx said. This in this transition period, we have to build bonds of international solidarity. And this is the stepping stone 
to a final withering away of nations and national divisions. So I would say, I call this the materiality of nations because the other tendency is we think of nations as being merely about culture, about language, about what we eat, whether we eat bread or arepas or rotis. This is not it. That's part of it. Culture is also material. But nations are fundamentally economic categories. They are born out of the pressures generated by capitalism. When capitalism develops in some countries, it poses for other countries certain stark choices. The countries cannot refuse to make them. That choice is subordinate yourself to the countries that have already developed and become imperialist or pursue your own path towards becoming more productive and capable of holding your own. This process has already had a long history. Britain's development force, Germany, Japan, the United States, all these countries who engage in a state-led industrialization with which to counter the power of Britain. Soon afterwards, this was followed by the Soviet Union, which blazed a different trail, a non-capitalist path, to creating high levels of productive capacity. Again, in the context of by protecting and managing the country's relations with the rest of the world. Free trade is the slogan of the imperialist powers. Free trade opens up weak economies and, 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 and leaves them exposed for capitalists from all over the world to exploit. You need to have borders to intelligently manage them in order to counter these imperialist powers. So that's the first point. The second point I want to make is that the imperialist powers, as we all recognize, many speakers have spoken about the weakening of imperialism. It's very important to understand that this kind of industrialization, which Trotsky called combined development, this kind of industrialization does weaken the power of imperialism. And the more successful it is, the more productive capacity spreads, whether it spreads in capitalist forms or, uh, or, or socialist forms or some other form, the more this spreads, the more imperial power is weakened. And Trotsky named this dialectic uneven and combined development. Imperialist countries want to maintain the uneven configuration of capitalism. They want to use the privileges they get from that uneven configuration. And countries that have the political power and capacity to do so, they have, that have their people behind them, can challenge this by combined development. So this is a dialectic and this has been a long, centuries-long process in which imperialism has arrived at the present state of weakening. The weakening is apparent, but of course, as we all know, a powerful force that has become weak also becomes vicious. And we are witnessing the viciousness of imperialism. It is an ineffectual viciousness in the long run. It is not able to achieve what it wants, but it can wreak a lot of destruction along the way as the Venezuelan people can testify today with all the sanctions and which are nothing short of war by economic means. Finally, the third major element of geopolitical economy is what I used to call multipolarity and which since my first visit to Venezuela back in 2017 when I was instructed by my Venezuelan comrades, I, all, I have learned to call pluripolarity because that's what Hugo Chavez called it. And this term is a better one because the term multipolarity implies that say China as a concentration of economic power is no different from the United States or the European Union, but of course it is. China is a non-capitalist society. We can have a day-long discussion, we can organize another long seminar on what exactly China is, but it isn't capitalist in any simplistic sense. What Hugo Chavez meant by this was that this type of uh, spread of productive capacity does take place, and it can only take place through a variety of economic forms. Because precisely by opposing the free trade slogans and the free market slogans and open up your borders slogans, you create, even if you are a capitalist country, you would at least begin to create a rather different type of economy. So it's about multipolarity or pluripolarity. So what does this mean for the situation that uh, Venezuela faces? Economy. I feel that we have already learned a lot uh, about can be, indeed must be, 
uh, so an economy which is superior to capitalism even productively and not just in redistributive terms. It, is, it should be superior to capitalism and this is not impossible. We easily forget that back in the 1950s and 60s, the Soviet Union demonstrated higher growth rates than the, than the capitalist world. So much so that uh, people, uh, important intellectuals in Western countries began to say that today the main contradiction in capitalism is, is not between class, uh, you know, rich and poor, between capitalists and workers, it is intersystemic between capitalism and communism, which will prove the superior system. Today, in, at a time when people constantly rubbish the actual experience of uh, uh, socialism in our world, this is easy to forget. And of course today it is not a wonder that China is so dynamic. The key, the, the key to it is that China, the Chinese Communist Party, the party state in China, planned its economy. That is how you can overcome the, the ups and downs of capitalism and have a steadily growing economy. So I want to concentrate on the links between a socialist economy or an economy that is challenging uh, the existing distribution of power in the world um, and its international links. And I want to further in this concentrate on the international money system, the international monetary system. There is a lot of misunderstanding about the international monetary system. And this misunderstanding exists for a good reason. It exists because it serves the interests of the Western countries in general and the United States in particular whose currencies and financial institutions dominate their system. So they have to systematically produce lies about it in order to prevent people from thinking clearly about what's really going on in that system. Let me take just one lie. There are so many I can't deal with them right now. Let me just take one lie. We are told that the international monetary system is dominated by the dollar and this will continue for a very long time. However, few people, any, anyone who actually bothers to investigate the real history of how the dollar came to be the world's currency and how it performed once it did so, they, they will, if they care to look at it, they will see that first of all, throughout the 1950s and 60s, that is to say that we are, we are told that the dollar kind of was made the world currency at Bretton Woods at the end of the Second World War, but in reality, throughout the 1950s and 60s, this system was ridden with problems. By the 1960s, things were so bad that major European countries were saying, you keep your dollars, please give us gold instead, which you promised to do. So we don't want it. Things went from bad to worse at such a speed that in, in about two short decades, we came to the moment of 1971, when the uh, gold window, as we say metaphorically, the gold window was closed, which is to say simply that the Americans stopped exchanging dollars for gold because they'd run out of gold that they run out of their own gold and their friends' gold as well. So, for Western capitalists to go and make short-term investments there to cream off the profits made in these economies. South Korea, Thailand, Indonesia and countries like this which did not have capital controls had their economies brought to their knees in this process. There was of course the dot-com bubble. There was the 2008 housing and credit bubble. Even today, this speculation continues thanks to the bailout offered by the government and above all, the biggest bailout that has been offered is of course the uh, free money being given by the Federal Reserve in the form of low in, in, uh, interest rates and the so-called quantitative easing in which the Federal Reserve says to uh, uh, banks and financial institutions that caused the crisis, says here, take good money and give us your bad assets. This is what has happened. Okay, so this is, these are the financial crises on which the dollar system depends because the dollar system essentially, dollars are demanded by the rich people. They create the demand for dollars and then we are told, oh look, the dollar is the most liquid currency. But participating in this sort of economic system is like essentially, I don't know, taking part in a meal where the food is maybe very good for the people sitting on the table but for you it's poison because that's what it is. So essentially this system requires the rest of the world to cooperate by participating in it. Governments in the rest of the world would do so only because they are slaves of the very rich people who benefit 
from taking money in and out of countries. Um, ordinary people, people like you and me, pay the price of it. Let me just give you a small example. Every time there is a financial crisis, those who are at the top of the financial system, the Warren Buffetts and all the CEOs and the CFOs or the, you know, the executives of the big companies, they actually benefit. They do not suffer and then they actually benefit from the financial crisis. The rest of you, with your little small savings, your pension funds, your mutual funds, the rest of us, our pension funds are hard or you know, they lose a lot of money because there is an international pecking order in finance and this is what happens. So, it, we pay the price. We pay the price of losing our savings. We pay the price of economic devastation and unemployment that inevitably follows. <coughs> and of course, in general, this kind of financialized economy means that we also pay the price because it encourages rich people to invest in unproductive activities rather than productive activities which would create jobs for you and me. One of the biggest problems with this sort of financialization is that those who are very rich can make a lot of money without making any real good or service. They don't have to make anything that you and I can enjoy. They can simply skim off our wages and profits. One can go on, but I just wanted to uh, say that this is the kind of system the US dollar's acceptance relies on. We need to move away from it. How can we do so? The solution actually was proposed 75 years ago. 2019 is the 75th anniversary of the Bretton Woods Conference. The Bretton Woods Conference is generally regarded as the conference at which big powers met and determined how the future of the world would go. And there are many myths around that. I don't want to go into that. We are told that that is where it was agreed that the dollar would be made the world's currency. In reality, people wanted something very different. But the Americans insisted on, the Americans refused to agree to any of those plans. And so the dollar de facto became for a this became uh, or tried to become the world's currency but as we have just explained this has not proceeded very well. So at, in, the, in the 1940s John Maynard Keynes of Britain actually proposed a very different system. He proposed a system in which countries would agree to create an artificial currency called Bancor and then would trade with each other. So you and I could not buy a piece bar of chocolate in Bangkok. 